Invest Africa, proudly brought to you by KPMG. Hello and a warm welcome to the special edition of Invest Africa where we are coming to you from the World Economic Forum on Africa taking place in Cape Town, South Africa. Now the theme for this year which is the 25th anniversary of WEF on the continent is then and now reimagining Africa's future and this forms the basis of our discussion for this evening's conversation on Invest Africa. I've got three guests with me who are going to give us their views as to how we can help drive and bolster economic growth across the continent. Continent. I'd like to introduce Dabo Akubadeju, who's a partner and uh, Africa Head of Deal Advisory and Private Equity at KPMG. Jennifer Blanca, she's a Chief Economist and Member of the Management Committee at the World Economic Forum. And Stanley Subramani, Chairman of the NEPAD Business Foundation. Lady and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'd like us to start off firstly by getting a broad overview of some of the gains that we've managed to make over the last 25 years in light of uh, this year's WEF agenda taking place here in Cape Town. Dabo, if we can start with you, uh, obviously you the money man, as many people like to refer to you as, but um, in your view, the kind of gains that we've made? Um, generally, I think that uh, Africa has received so much attention in, in, in the last few years, and I think the attention that Africa has received is not misplaced. Uh, it's largely as a result of the significant growth that we've experienced in the last few years. Uh, if you look at it, um, Globally, Africa, or you know, the, the, the six of the top ten fastest growing uh, economies, you know, are actually in Africa, and so you know, there are a lot of uh, drivers that are actually driving that growth, and I think uh, some of those drivers um, are you know things about the, dem the demographic uh, advantage that we have, the youngest population mm. all across globally. We also have the fact that there's a lot of uh, public sector reforms that we're seeing, you know, democracy is taking root in Africa. There's still pockets of uh, issues. Um, also, we're seeing increased rate of urbanization that's also driving the growth as well. And we've also benefited significantly from, uh, you know, rising com you know, commodity prices. And I think putting all of these together, uh, and uh, you know, coupled with the impact of technology, especially telecoms transformation that we're seeing in Africa right now, I think it's really catapulted and brought Africa to a major uh, pool of attention, you know. And the question for me is how sustainable this is, you know, mm. is it a hype or is it uh, here to stay, you know. And I think it has to be a combination of uh, the government uh, at different levels, you know, uh, working to facilitate or, or encourage investment and also providing the much needed infrastructure and allow the... And, obviously uh, put in place necessary policies and allow the private sector to drive the growth. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, Dapo did mention the word sustainability of yes. this hype. Clearly this is where you come in. Yes, I mean, I think what we've seen over you know, the past one or two decades is that there's been very impressive growth in Africa after a long stagnation. Uh, and this is something that's clearly very important. Uh, there have been great strides in terms of governance, uh, as you mentioned, uh, in terms of sort of you know, getting kids to school, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of collaboration across borders, but it's very important to keep in mind that a lot of the growth over the past few years has been fueled by commodity prices. Uh, and, you know, Africa, many African countries still remain quite low in the value chain. Uh, so I think going forward, in order to ensure that it's sustainable, really a big focus needs to be on, you know, investment in infrastructure, continuing investment in education, and not just education in schools, but also on-the-job training, vocational training, really making sure that you don't have this skills gap uh, mm -hmm. as we sort of move up the value chain in Africa. Uh, and I think that there, the sense really is that something is changing. This is a very, very rapidly growing region. It has caught the attention of investors around the world, there's no doubt. But we have to remember it's from a low base and there's a lot of work left to do. Mm -hmm. uh, Stanley, you clearly have your eyes and feet on the ground over the last 25 years in light of both of all, in light of what both of your colleagues have said, uh, the, the key highlights of this progress over the last 25 years. Well, thank you, Google, and good evening. I think if you take Africa back 25 years ago, 1990, the world was a different place. Africa was a different place. Nelson Mandela was in jail, Zimbabwe just achieved independence, and so did Namibia. Uh, 25 years ago, Africa was a dark and hopeless continent. Mm. It was a continent of strife, about wars, malnutrition, 
and poverty. Fast forward to 25 years, 2015. The theme is Africa is rising. Africa is growing. We've got a population in excess of a billion people across the continent. And as my colleague said, we've got six of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world. But more importantly, I think what we've got now is we've got what is called the demographic dividend. We have a young population across the African continent, uh, a population that's graduating to middle class, better educated, but importantly across the continent, we're seeing the breaking out of democracy. For example, uh, Nigeria, for the first time, there's been uh, a change of guard from a civilian government mm. to another civilian government, the same in Ghana, the same in Ethiopia. So it's a story of hope, it's a story of vision, uh, it's a story of a continent on the rise. But there are challenges, and over the course of the next uh, 20 minutes, we can discuss some of the challenges. But Africa, as Jennifer said, offers significant opportunities uh, to investors, both local and foreign. The continent is open for business. So we urge businesses throughout the continent and from across the world to come and invest in Africa. It is the next frontier. The next frontier. All of this ties in, obviously, with the fundamentals of economic growth, and you need infrastructure, which you alluded to, Jennifer. Maybe if you can give us more depth into the Africa Strategic Infrastructure Initiative, which has been instituted by WEF, as to how we can go about with that. And uh, Dapo, if you can come in again uh, with the angle as to uh, the funding. Is there too much or is there too little? What do we need to do to drive the continued infrastructure development on the continent? Look, I think we have an understanding that there's almost a hundred billion uh, dollar deficit every year in terms of infrastructure uh, building uh, in Africa. And so this is something that really does need to be addressed. What the World Economic Forum has recognized, and I think many, many um, you know, bodies around the world, including NAPAD, uh, that we're working with quite closely, uh, is that you need to have the private sector quite involved. Um, mm. The private sector has both the financing and the know-how that the public sector doesn't necessarily have. And at the same time, uh, they don't necessarily have um, the trust uh, in, the, in things going forward in the, in the way that is planned in the beginning. Uh, and so you have these sort of blended finance models that are coming about uh, at this point where you actually have the government or you, know, you could even have um, development agencies coming in and helping at least in the startup. Uh, in the planning phase, which then makes it a lot more attractive for the private sector to come in and be sure that they will actually recoup uh, their investment. Uh, so it's a win-win in a sense. If you look at infrastructure, it's a win-win because it's both something that is an investment yeah. where you can gain, but also it's an investment in the future in terms of um, boosting productivity going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, Dapo, I picked up that uh, tweet from you not too long ago where you said that there's a 94, 54 rather, trillion naira shortage to fill the infrastructure gap. That's in Nigeria alone. Never mind the number you quoted on the rest of the continent, Jennifer. Is the money there? Yeah, I think that uh, the challenges of infrastructure uh, in Africa is not just about the financing. You know, to be honest with you, there will always be financing if the infrastructure project is properly structured. Mm. The issue is about structuring, and the issue is also about how best do we do it in Africa. You know, what is the right business model for us to really put in place? proper infrastructure in Africa. And I'm going to talk about it from four or five different perspectives. The first is, when you're talking about Africa, we need to have an infrastructure, long-term strategic plan on infrastructure. And that long-term strategic plan, you know, uh, doesn't have to be only country by country. Yes, it starts with a country. But we need to begin to look at the scalability of the infrastructure because the objective has to be that there is linkages, you know, uh, across Africa, you know. Regional cooperation. Regional cooperation. And the linkages, you know, would be physical, would be movement of people and resources, and would be also accessibility of finance. Because when you look at most markets in Africa, even funding the infrastructure, Right, you, you know, you're only going to be able to count a few countries that really have the scale to be able to do it well. So we need to be able to enjoy some skill economies in the way that is done, and that has to be the role of government in ensuring that you know the you know starting from regional government, and we have some of them that are doing well. We've done it successfully in telecoms infrastructure mm -hmm. when uh, the the international submarine cables uh, were brought into Africa. Uh, from East Africa to West Africa and all of that. So, you know, so that is one, the business model and having a long-term strategic plan. The second thing is that 
we have to begin to look at infrastructure and also mining as not necessarily, particularly mining, not, a, not as an extractive industry. It has to be a transformational industry. It's an industry that provides the bedrock. You know, it's an asset we have. So we have to use what we have to get what we want. The model about, you know, uh, you know uh, China, you know, Chinese government coming into Africa to a back on pit to pot projects mm. without really bringing in the local community to, a, to, 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 to enjoy or, uh, the wider and broader benefits of this, you know. We have to relook at that again, you know. Uh, you know, when you build a rail line, 4,000 kilometer rail, from the port to the pit, mm -hmm. how do you ensure that the local community connect with that? How do you ensure that we use that same infrastructure to benefit the agri community? And I'm going to use the example of Nigeria in the financing. You look at it, um, just a few years ago, we introduced a defined contributory pension scheme, all right? When you look at that scheme in, in itself, it's created a culture of savings contributions from employees and also from employers. Fast track five years after, we've amassed such a huge amount of fund. But at the moment, or just shortly before now, the only investment outlet for that fund is restricted to you know, listed entities, all right? How could we have amassed so much fund and we're not using it to, 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 to a catalytic effect? All right, so now what the Nigerian government has done, at least, is to allow about 10% of that fund to be used for investment in infrastructure and private equity, 5% each. Mm -hmm. Just recently as well, they've now recently allowed uh, that fund to be used for, as a security for mortgages. Because in Africa, we have got no mortgages, you know. Then the fourth point and the last point is with respect to infrastructure is oftentimes what lacks, the demand is there. You know, I mean, you know, if you go to Lagos, it's huge traffic. Mm. You go to many, many places, it's traffic. So the problem is going to be how does government put in place a proper regulatory framework to ensure that even when private sector participation comes in, you know, there's transparency in the procurement, there is effective uh, monitoring of the standards, the service level agreements that have been agreed. The issue about continuity of project would not be a problem. So when successive governments come in, you know, they are coming in within the framework of a of a of a framework that has you know structure that has already put in place. So and I think those are the areas. Don't develop their own. You're quite right. You've mentioned quite a few areas which we will delve into. Obviously, the regional uh, cooperation as well as government framework. How investors need to react to this. We're going to take a short ad break for now, but we will return right after this break. Welcome back to this uh, special episode of Invest Africa, coming to you from the World Economic Forum taking place in Cape Town. Are we talking about growth and how we can spur that on the African continent? And just before the ad break, we had uh, some uh, several pointers being highlighted by DAPO that need to be addressed. I'd like to come to you for a moment, Stanley, to uh, focus firstly on government. Uh, you obviously interact with them quite a bit, but represent the private sector to a large extent. Are African governments making it easy for the money, the regional integration? for the mindset of this consumer to actually change on the continent? Well, thank you, Gugu. Firstly, let me just say that uh, Africa is poor because Africa is expensive. It's very expensive to do business across the African continent. A simple example, it takes you 68 days to get a generator from South Africa to Lubumbashi. Hmm. So clearly that is a cost to business. And so we talked before the break about infrastructure, and Jennifer correctly points out that the infrastructure deficit uh, per year is $100 billion. You take it over 10 years, that's $1 trillion of infrastructure deficit. So African governments have come together through the auspices of the African Union. 
and we've crafted a vision called Agenda 2063. It's a 50-year vision to put Africa on a path of sound, sustainable economic development. And key to this whole infrastructure push is a program called PIDA, the Program for Infrastructure Development across the African continent. And as we said before, you know, there's no shortage of money in Africa, mm. and there's no shortage of money across the world. What we do have is we have a shortage of bankable projects. Mm. You know, investors will put the money in, provide there's a relationship between the risk and the reward. And as we say, Africa gives you very rich rewards. One needs, one needs to manage, manage the risk. So infrastructure across the continent is key to unlocking the potential. As you travel across the continent, all roads lead to the port. Yeah. So what we do is that our economies are designed to basically dig the dirt out of the ground, Absolutely. put them on a train, mm -hmm. put them on a ship, and Take export them. them. Yeah. And then we import the finished product. So what we do in the continent is that we export wealth and we import poverty. Mm. We export wealth and we import poverty. So part of Agenda's uh, 2063 vision is to beneficiate is to make sure that we re-industrialize, that we manufacture, that we create jobs. And key to this whole thing is intra-Africa trade. One of the problems we have across the African continent is that intra-Africa trade is a mere 12%. So as Africans, we do not trade amongst ourselves. Mm. We continue to trade uh, with our colonial, uh, <laughs> colonial masters. So key to the whole thing is to look at cross-border, how do we move seamlessly across borders, uh, people and goods? Uh, we've got to be looking at a, a continental free trade agreement. It's absolutely essential. Uh, essentially, I think at some point in time, we've got to be looking at an African Union passport, where it's easy for my colleague from Nigeria to come to South Africa, mm. and for me to go from South Africa to Nigeria. That's the only way you can become globally competitive. You know, the world is becoming a very small place. The world is becoming very competitive. And unless we drive the cost of business down, we simply are not going to be competitive. So part of the infrastructure play is to make sure we put Africa on a competitive edge. Absolutely. Competitive. Uh, Jennifer, mm -hmm. to come to you on this one, I think it was a 2013-2014 World Competitiveness Report where five of the top uh, uh, most competitive economies, not one single African country was represented on, on that list, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. To go back to the points that were mentioned by both Dapo and Stanley, uh, we need to clearly cultivate certain sectors in our African economies mm -hmm. which don't just simply export yes. uh, what expensively and import uh, right. poverty. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? How do we make African economies more competitive? Right. I mean, I think there are a few things to keep in mind here. I mean, you have a couple of large economies, such as Nigeria, such as South Africa. Mm. But, I mean, just to echo um, the comments about regional integration, that's going to be critical no matter which um, which uh, sector you're talking about, because each of these small economies can't compete on their own. Not when you start moving beyond the sort of digging the stuff out of the ground and, and sending it on. So I think um, certainly regional integration will be part of it, but then if you look at the sort of forward and backward linkages that you want to sort of get involved in, I mean, clearly some of them are going to be sort of in Botswana in terms of, you know, how do you um, cultivate the diamonds after you've actually pulled them out, um, marketing, and, and a lot of this is start, starting to happen, uh, and things of that nature. But I think also, um, as well as, you know, agriculture, which is going to be important in terms of continuing to improve. I mean, everybody sort of neglects that, but there's still 50% of, of Africans who are land. working. Well, and 50% of Africans who are still working in that sector. So mm -hmm. we have to remember that. Um, but I think uh, it's very important to recognize that Africa is moving very much into services. So it's a lot of the services sectors that will be very important. And it sort of echoes what, what was just mentioned in terms of you know cross-border uh, movement in terms of tourism. Tourism has a huge uh, potential uh, in Africa. And many countries are just not actually benefiting from that. One of the things that we've been working on quite closely is the um, possibility of having a single visa for Africa. Uh, and this will be something that will make it much easier for people to come and, and, and benefit and experience uh, all of Africa, or at least large parts of Africa. And so I think you know clearly there's areas in manufacturing that you can move up and down the value chain, or hopefully up the value chain. But in services, I think we should not neglect that. Uh, and, and African economies really need to be looking at how to, to move into these. We are still global players, though, even though we need to compete amongst ourselves as Africans and obviously on the global stage. But what does this mean about the relationship that we need to change 
matched up or with uh, uh, the rest of the world, especially the Chinese participants who, as we've mentioned in this discussion, are very active uh, when it comes to uh, putting their money into the continent, but maybe unfortunately taking it back uh, to their own banks and uh, developing and, and earning some kind of reward on their risk there. Uh, what needs to change in our trade relations with maybe the West, the East and even our European peers? Um, I think that uh, the point made earlier is, is, is very potent about uh, the need for regional integration and cooperation and to significantly increase the intra-Africa trade uh, because that will enable us, first of all, to ensure that um, we are globally competitive in, in, in areas uh, where we have very strong competitive advantages. You, know, you, may, you look at Ghana, for instance, and Ivory Coast. In, you know, they are top producers of cocoa. Mm. But they produce so much cocoa, all right, and export it as beans, and they import the chocolates. You know, so the question about uh, how we force the successful execution of value chain strategies mm -hmm. in Africa is critical. Number two is that, you know, we talk about reforms, 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 and I think that uh, there might be a need for a slight change in the way that Africa government implement reforms, public sector reforms. And what I'm leaning towards is that we, we tend to focus on reforms from purely sector perspective. That's not going to achieve a lot of mileage. And the reason I'm saying that is very, very simple. Uh, the, the boundaries of sectors, they're thinning out at the moment, you know, the guy or the company you thought wasn't your competitor, all of a sudden, you know, uh, whoever knew uh, how much influence Apple as a technology company would have on telecoms. Mm -hmm. So the point is, we need to first of all sit down and possibly adopt uh, what Professor Michael Potter uh, has implemented or has you know, brought about the cluster strategy to reform, which means you sit down and do a high level analysis as to which sector has the greatest contribution or greatest impact and just reform the value chain and that value chain will cut across several sectors and that way you're going to be quick to implement to successful implementation and uh, we're also going to make it sustainable and then people are going to be employed and engaged I'm going to ask you to pause there because uh, we are under time pressures. But Stanley, uh, do you agree, Jennifer? Stanley, let's start with you. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, I think the time for Africa has come. The time for strategic reforms, the time for positioning is absolutely right. You know, a simple example is every year the African continent imports around about $35 billion of food. This is a continent that has the largest amount of arable land available. $35 billion gets uh, leaves our shore. So part of the thinking is to look at uh, centers of excellence, is to look at countries that have got the competitive edge mm. uh, and to maximize on it. We cannot take, Africa has got 54 countries, we cannot take a country by country exactly. approach. We've got to take a regional approach, we've got to take a holistic approach, but more, more importantly we've got to take a long-term approach. Uh, that will put this continent on a growth trajectory that will far surpass anything that's seen on planet Earth. Right. How do we do that with the skills that we need? Because as you mentioned, yeah. we, we, we need the brain matter yeah. to do this. Well, and I would say it's quite hard to pick winners. Uh, there are some things that are sort of obvious. I mean, if you look at Nigeria, again, it's clear that there has to be more refineries that are actually functioning in Nigeria so that yeah. they're not actually exporting things and then having long, long lines or no, no gas at all when they actually get to the pump. Um, but I think, you know, when we think about competitiveness, there are a certain number of things that you need no matter what. Uh, you're going to get into. You need infrastructure, you need cross-border trade, uh, and you need what good education. Uh, and so I think, you know, every, uh, lots of different organizations are trying to figure out what exactly that means. I think there are a few things that we know. Uh, we know that you need to have the private sector involved in the discussion on what's needed uh, in the educational sector. You need the private sector actually stepping up and taking responsibility for some of that actually within their own organizations because, you know, the government can't do it alone. Um, we know that uh, 
you know, basically early childhood education is very important for getting people to think differently. Yes. And I would just end on saying that it's a mindset change. You need a really entrepreneurial mentality, I think, in Africa. The idea that we can do it and then giving people the skills and the basic infrastructure that they need to do that. Mm -hmm. Just to get closing comments uh, from each of you here, if we take a look at the next 25 years, tying back to the theme here at the World Economic Forum in Africa, uh, reimagining Africa's future. Dap, we've highlighted several pointers that we need to go through to really change all of this, but uh, clearly it all starts with the youth. We have a very high population of young individuals, which Jennifer has already alluded to, that we need to educate and uh, pass on the skills that each of you possess onto these young individuals. In uh, uh, your essence and in summation, uh, your, your sentiments regarding youth and uh, giving them the necessary skills yeah. to grow Africa. Very, very briefly, I think that uh, the trends that we're seeing in Africa now is the power of the citizenry. Uh, we've seen it in Egypt and we've just seen it in Nigeria. The power of citizenry coupled with the technology of social media, I think is something we need to lash on seriously and then ensure that we use it to drive the growth and force even the public sector and government to drive the growth. Lastly is the whole issue around education. We need to completely relook re at because even if you have the growth mm. and your people are not feeding into that growth, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's going to amount to nothing. We have to look at the education, particularly vocational training. You know, so and I think if we look at those, I think uh, uh, we will be able to ensure that we create the jobs and the jobs actually stay in Africa. Well, it does seem that we have to leave it there, unfortunately, as we wrap up this edition of Invest Africa. Coming to you from the World Economic Forum, the 25th anniversary here on the African continent. A big thank you to all of my guests today. We did touch the tip of the iceberg as to how to tackle economic growth on the continent, but it's a conversation that will continue. Thanks once more to my guests, Dapo Akupadeju. He's a partner and Africa head for Deal Advisory and Private Equity at KPMG. Jennifer Blanca, Chief Economist uh, and member of the Management Committee at the World Economic Forum and Stanley Subramani. He's the chairman of the NIPAD Business Foundation. Do join us again next time on Invest Africa where we tackle small issues with regard to African growth.